Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Stephen Humphreys. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and I specialise in adult ADHD. What I thought I'd do today is a short video on how t you might decide that you want assessment for ADHD in adulthood. It's quite a big decision. It's not always cheap to get an assessment privately. And I've assessed many people over many years and they quite often would like to know beforehand whether or not they're barking up the wrong tree. So in order to help you decide, um, I thought I'd run through some of the typical features that present in adulthood as opposed to childhood. And it is rather different. What I won't be doing is I won't be going into what doctors call etiology or pathology. In other words, we won't be dealing with the causes of ADHD or the structural brain changes or biochemical changes that occur, because that's for another video, perhaps. The first thing to say very clearly, this is a common condition. There's very, very robust research which suggests that about 4% of the population have ADHD in adulthood and that less than 1% are diagnosed. So it is massively underdiagnosed. Part of the reason for that is historical. If you go to parts of America, maybe 6 to 12% of people are diagnosed with the condition, and that's probably too many. In this country, it's less than 1%. British psychiatry in adulthood always looked at ADHD as part of a hyperkinetic disorder. This is not the same condition. This is a very severe condition associated usually with brain damage. Spotting someone with hyperkinesis is relatively straightforward. ADHD is a much milder, more subtle condition and much more common. It also wasn't helped by some very uh, influential research which was carried out in the 1990s which appeared to show that children at the age of 18 magically stopped getting ADHD. This was very convenient in some ways um, and there's still some of that around that adults cannot have ADHD. The truth of the matter is that that research was debunked. The reason being that they used the wrong scales. They used childhood scales for adults. And if you use adult scales for adults, we find that 60 to 70% of people retain symptoms. But the profile of symptoms differs in adults. There's much less hyperactivity. There's much less impulsivity, although that still does exist and the inattentiveness, which is the third of the features, remains. So an adult is far more likely to present with inattentive features than gross hyperactivity. That's relatively uncommon in adults. The other, the other question that is sometimes raised when we talk about adults with ADHD is, surely everybody would respond to treatment with stimulants, which are the mainstay of treatments in ADHD. You know, give people amphetamines or Ritalin, they're going to feel more animated, better focused. This isn't actually true. There's been some significant research done recently which shows that people without ADHD who take stimulants to enhance their cognitive performance actually decline in their performance. It's only people with ADHD that respond properly to treatment. What might you notice if you um, have ADHD and it hasn't been diagnosed and you're an adult? You might think you might be feeling that you were always somewhat different perhaps from your siblings maybe you in, in your family you stood out as rather different in approach to things you often children with ADHD often find it very difficult to sleep they can't settle they have problems with school parents are always being dragged in to complain about naughty children they're chatterboxes, they're always in detention, they're often very active and into sports. But in a way, that's the easy way to, that's the easy form. Um, a lot of people don't present like that. Particularly if there is not as much hyperactivity, children and adults often present with inattentiveness. They're described as a daydreamer. And if you're lucky enough to be intelligent, and this is not the same as concentration. Concentration is a part of performance related to intelligence. But if you're an intelligent child, you can coast. You can coast through primary school easily. You don't need to do anything, just it, it's natural. Often children in primary school in the early stages of secondary school with ADHD don't do any preparation. They don't study. They don't 
they don't do any homework, they don't do any coursework. They turn up for exams and they're bright and they, they, do, they, they do well. It tends to start to bite, however, at secondary school. I see so many people who um, got through primary school okay, went to secondary school and they needed to hand in coursework, they needed to do homework, they just didn't do it. What they often rely upon is the effect of stress with, a, with an impending deadline to generate focus. What happens is that, that their, your adrenal glands respond to the, uh, to the fear of, of an impending exam. They start to produce cortisol and adrenaline, which drives you into an all-night state of hyperfocus. So, so many people I see day-to-day -day got through exams on basically an all-nighter. They were unable to um, work consistently towards a goal. And this, this is okay at, at a certain level, but it starts to get more and more difficult as you get older. Because basically what is happening is you're driving yourself into a stressed state to provoke focus. And you can't do A-levels very easily on that sort of stress. You certainly can't do exams or dissertations at university on a night study. And what often happens is that people peak at GCSEs, which to an intelligent person are relatively easy to accomplish without much study. And they start to flounder at A-levels and then they fall apart at university. Another issue with universities is, of course, it's a much less structured environment. You are told what to do much less and monitored much less. And it's quite common for people with ADHD to get through A-levels and then to pancake at, at, uni at university level. Or if they get a bit further and they end up with doing a master's, the dissertation has seven or eight deferrals and it takes years to complete something which should take one year. One other misunderstanding about ADHD is that concentration is constant, and it isn't. People's concentration varies, and parents and teachers sometimes say to me, or, or work colleagues, well, if he likes something or she likes something, they can concentrate on it. Well, that's not surprising. That, that, that just happens. Often people with ADHD have islands of what's called hyperfocus. They can concentrate on computer games for days on end, but they can't do 10 minutes homework. So it, it's, it isn't just about concentrating, it's about the nature of the task. Things like computer games, certain pastimes evoke a lot of dopamine release, which provokes hyperfocus. Let's be clear, the hyperactivity in adulthood is often not present, or, it's, or it remains as a bit of fidgeting or restless legs. Impulsivity is often less in adulthood than in children. We learn social adaptation, social restraints. We, we learn that if we keep on butting into conversations, we don't have any friends, so we stop doing it. We override um, some of those features. It's the inattentiveness which often persists into adulthood. And our ne next one to turn to how does that present itself? The sort of people that I see in adulthood with ADHD, their life is usually a bit of a mess. Everything's incomplete, whether that be the washing, the ironing, the, the, the dishes, study, work, ch meals. Things get started, people get distracted partway through and leave them unfinished. The same applies often to careers. People with ADHD often have, mul have had multiple jobs. They enter, a, they enter a job or a qualification with enthusiasm and then they run out of steam. And so they've often had several attempts at university, moved job every few months or, or, or every year or so as they lose interest and they lose the dopamine drive. Procrastination is a mainstay of ADHD. I've never seen anybody with ADHD who didn't procrastinate. They put things off till the very last moment, particularly things which they don't want to do, but also anything that is fairly routine. So tax returns don't get sent in, bills don't get paid, you know, court summons has come for, for uh, uh, unpaid traffic fines, things like that. Most people with ADHD in adulthood are intensely distractible, both to external stimuli but often also to internal thought. They cannot stick with a train of thought without becoming diverted to something else, which leads to what's called difficulties with sequential processing. So they do not do A, B, C, D, they do A, D, F, N, Z, B, and go back again and leave everything incomplete in the meantime. Another common feature of ADHD in adulthood is zoning out, as it's called. 
you're talking to a person and you can tell they're not really listening. They're thinking about something else. And often they can come back into focus, but there's a, there's a drift and the eyes disappear as they start to think about what they're going to do later on that day, perhaps, or something totally inconsequential. People with ADHD in adulthood often, but not always, have difficulties with sustaining relationships, difficulties with um, maintaining consistency in relationships. Uh, and so they, they often move from one relationship to another. At the early stages, when there's a lot of excitement and drive, it engages them and then they move on. Adults with ADHD very, very commonly have associated what's called comorbid mood disorder or uh, emotional dysregulation which is usually a sense of anxiety, frustration and low-grade depression, often misdiagnosed as depression, but it's a consequence of the, of the chronic disorganisation. People may self-medicate, they may go into uh, phases of substance misuse, particularly stimulant drugs, which of course produce an improvement in focus and concentration, and often not the euphoria that somebody without ADHD experiences. And the other thing to say is that a common treatment for mood disorders are SSRI antidepressants. SSRI antidepressants tend to make ADHD slightly worse. A serotonin, which is the, uh, the chemical increased by those antidepressants, has an antagonistic effect towards dopamine. There are antidepressant treatments which work much better in people with ADHD, but the standard sertraline, Prozac, citalopram often reduce anxiety, but they often do not improve the, the concentration. So that's probably as much as I want to say for today in the setting of a, of a short video, which is aimed at people with ADHD who don't sustain their concentration much longer than 10 minutes, so I'm not going to go on for hours. It is a common condition, just to recap, a common condition, often misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, eminently treatable. The modern treatments are much better there are treatments which last all day, which are non-addictive, do not induce tolerance, uh, and which do not have serious side effects. Those treatments do not need to be taken every day. They're, and this, this is a, an, an, an eye-opening moment for a lot of patients. They realise that they're not beholden. They don't have to take the, the treatment every day. They may have days off, they may have weeks off. There's some very good long-term research recently um, which shows that nearly everybody on treatment for ADHD has breaks, whether it be long or short. Um, it's not a life sentence. It's a bit like these, a pair of glasses you, you, you wear in order to focus. When I go swimming, I don't wear my glasses, I don't need them. So it's the same with ADHD treatments. People may use them at times of study. Some may use them all the time, but often you can have breaks and there is no need for continued treatment and they work straight away once the appropriate dose is achieved. So there's a lot that can be done out there and hopefully this video will give you some idea of the sort of things to look for if you're considering that maybe you have a problem and it needs assessment. Thank you.